What's up guys, Pete here, and in today's video, we're gonna do something a little bit special. I'm gonna draw upon my 11 to 12 years experience in this industry. I've worked with hundreds and hundreds of different private students throughout that time, many of whom have achieved their goals. They've gone really far. Others have kind of got nowhere. There are people in the middle that maybe had some success, but then got stuck and didn't quite get to where they want to be. So the title of this video, 10 Reasons Why You Don't Win at Poker, I don't literally mean that you don't win, although maybe you don't, maybe you're break even or a losing player, which is fine. Maybe it's just that you do win a bit, but you know that you're not unlocking your full potential. You know that you could do so much better, but you just can't quite see the magical breakthrough that's going to get you there. The 10 reasons for people getting stuck, not progressing as much as they could, are very likely to resonate with you. I'll warn you in advance that when you go through this video, you will probably have a few aha eureka moments where you suddenly see something that's been really holding you back. And if that's you, I'd urge you to share this in the comments. Let us know your experiences. What insights have you gained by watching this video that could help yourself or help others to achieve their poker goals? This list is not exhaustive. It's also not a technical list. It doesn't concern things like, oh, you don't see bet enough here, you don't call enough in this river spot. But rather today, we're going to be talking about procedural approaches to the game, mindset things, just your general practical approach to poker and your poker career. I hope this video is going to be transformational. I hope it's going to unlock some secrets that you guys need to make those vital changes to finally prepare you to achieving your poker dreams. Share your experiences, let me know what you think. Let's get started on point number one. The first thing that really can't be overstated is one of the most common things that people get wrong, playing too low, and by this I mean the stakes you're playing are too low. It can be tempting to work your way up from the bottom. It's not a nice feeling to lose a bunch of your capital, to lose something like $200 in a week when you're taking poker recreationally as a hobby and you're just trying to get your feet wet with it and get better, it doesn't feel good. So a lot of people start out at a game like 2NL, 5NL, 10NL, something like this. But the problem with these stakes is that the rake is so cripplingly high. And by that, I don't mean the rake percentage. If you look up the rake percentage for 10NL on PokerStars, for example, you will see it's like 4.5 or 5% or whatever it is. I can't remember what it is these days, but something like that. But it's the rake cap that really sticks it to you. The rate cap essentially means that if you get in 100 big blinds and the rate cap is 15 big blinds and only 5% of the pot is raked, then that means that the 200 big blind pot that basically arises as you and your opponent both felt for 100 big blinds, 15 big blinds is the rate cap, right? So what will happen there is that 5% of that pot will get raked. That's 10 big blinds. And because the rate cap is 15, we've not reached the rate cap yet. So 10 big blinds will come out of that pot. That means at 10 NL, if I'm not mistaken, when you get in a stack, you will only win 90 of your opponent's 100 big blinds. This is awful. And it happens in big pots left, right and center. It happens all the time. I've seen players that are actually really quite technically competent. I mean, much, much better than the average player at 10 NL, but their win rate is like one BB per 100 over a gigantic sample. They're break even, they're slightly losing. I haven't actually seen massive win rates at 10 NL because I don't believe it's possible. If I could go around wearing a t-shirt that gave people advice for poker in their poker career, I would definitely just have it say, stop playing 10 and L. Now let me give you guys a caveat here. If you're a losing player that is hemorrhaging money, you know, a lot, that has a, a large loss rate of maybe like 4 BB per 100 or worse, something like that. And that's okay if that's you, you know, there's no shame in that. We all start somewhere. Maybe you've been playing for years and that's still you because you've just not unlocked the secret to winning yet. You've not really got your hands on the right material or done the right things. You didn't watch a video like this that was going to show you where you've been going wrong. That's totally fine. And what that maybe means is that you can use a stake like 5NL or 10NL as a training ground, you know, a place to get beat up a bit post rake you will probably actually be beating your opponents before rake, right? If rake is like 10, 11 BB per 100, as it tends to be at these really severe rake cap micro games, you know, you're going to actually be better than the opposition, but that's not going to show after rake, right? So if you are losing at 4 or 5 BB per 100 still, because you're not beating people up enough, that's okay. And maybe you want to play 5 NL, 10 NL as a kind of training arena. But as soon as you are close to break even, it doesn't make sense to play the stake anymore. I've seen people move up from 10 NL to 25 NL and have a higher win rate over a large sample because the rate cap is now only 8 big blinds and it's much more reasonable. As you move up to 50 NL, that rate cap becomes 5 big blinds and then 2.5 big blinds at 100. So when you fill a whole stack at 100 NL, you get back like 97.5 of your opponent's big blinds instead of 90. That 7.5 big blind swing is hugely pivotal. 
Playing too low is also bad because if you're a player with sufficient skills to win at a higher stake, you're just winning less money, you're building your bankroll more slowly. So what you should really do guys is invest money from out with the game. It's okay to pay for coaching. It's okay to pay to give yourself a bankroll to play 15 no limit. If you're a decent poker player, why do you feel you have to grind it all up? It could take you a year or two years or something if you have a job, you're a professional, you don't have that much time for poker to grind up a roll from 10 and L or 5 and L, even if you're a winning player. So stop doing it. The dream of building a bankroll from the beginning, walking up the pyramid step by step and being able to say, I've never deposited a dime. I played free rolls and then I played 2 and L and 5 and L. A dream is silly. All that dream does is hold your progress back. Life is short. Your poker career is short. It's shorter than you think. You have less time to play poker than you think. Play higher. Skip ahead of the queue and don't reward these sites with these really unreasonable rake structures that they force upon us. The higher you play, the less money you need to worry about frittering away an extra rake. All right, let's go on to point number two. Guys, watching a carrot poker school training video is like getting an elite academic education in cash game poker that you simply cannot get anywhere else. If studying poker was like studying, say, law for instance, then choosing the Carrot Poker School would be like getting into the top law school in the country. Imagine getting 33 lectures from such an establishment for less than a thousand pounds. Most poker players struggle because they simply lack the theory necessary to understand the mechanics of this complex game properly. They get disorganized random content and rely on the advice of peers in study groups and forums who are also struggling. The Carrot Poker School gives you all of the material you need to achieve your wildest poker dreams. The rest is up to you. To pick up the Carrot Poker School today, click the top link in the description, head on over to CarrotCorner.com, add it to your cart, go to checkout, make a payment and you are done within 10 seconds. You can then download all of our videos and get ready to start your full scholarship. Let's get back to the action. Point number two is GTO Obsession. Not that many of you will suffer from this point, it won't actually be as prevalent as point number one, but the, those of you who do suffer from this point, it's actually very harmful. Sometimes I'm streaming or making a video or something and someone will come on the comments or come on the stream chat and they will just like quote solver outputs to me. They'll be like, Pete, you should do this. The solver says you should bet half pot here. You should see bet only 70% of the time on this texture and they really get bogged down in the details. When you first start working with this kind of software, you know, solvers, maybe free programs that you've picked up that just show you what to do. You maybe got a trial of like GTO Wizard or something and you're just dabbling in it for the first time. Then you end up subscribing. But your use of that program is simply looking up a spot and trying to validate whether you played it okay, whether the solver says your line is good. Maybe you're like, okay, I've learned that this is a 60% C bet this time, this hand on this texture, but you have no idea why. You have no clue why the solver is picking a big bet here only using block bets there, using a mix of over bet and small bet here. Like you just, you can't put it all together. And getting bogged down in the details, the frequencies, the exact finer points of a game theory output of a sim is a huge waste of time. When you're looking at a sim, you wanna do it the way we do it in the Carrot Poker School, where we use extracts from solvers to prove theoretical points, to teach you how poker works objectively, what the nuts and bolts are. It's all about understanding how and understanding why. It's not about just learning a ton of what. This is such a problem. Usually people have the wrong mix of GTO obsession and sort of exploitative vacuum based thinking where they just try to put their opponent on a range and you know, react accurately against that range. There's two schools of thought here and the correct way to go is to care about theory I don't even like the term GTO because GTO to me is just an output. It's like the final verdict of the solver after you've let it solve the spot for a while. But what that output, what that GTO really teaches you is how the inner workings of poker are and how the game functions logically. When you understand that and we teach you all of this in the Carrot Poker School, you can figure out exploits for every situation. You can see more clearly where your opponents are going wrong and you will have a base game in every spot that's common and important that is so secure and based on solid foundations that you just stop making many of the mistakes and blunders that those around you at your stakes are making. GTO obsession is when that goes too far and you start to lose sight of the forest for the trees or whatever they say. You begin to lose sight of what's really important and that is the whys and, and GTO outputs and Pile Solver and GTO Plus and all of these programs that you can use to get better at the theory side of the game. They're actually very useful 
right up until you start copying and looking at the exact details. That's when it becomes a sabotage to your game. It's actually detrimental to spend your time lost in the weeds of a solver, but it's very beneficial if you can derive broader meaning from that. That's very hard to do when you first start working with this kind of technology, which is why we built a school around showing you exactly why solvers do what they do and what the broad strokes are, what the meaningful patterns are what the objectivity of the game actually consists of. The opposite of this is when a player relies too heavily on exploits. Maybe they have a coach or mentor or friend or instructor who says something to them like, oh, you don't have to worry about GTO at these stakes. GTO is only for 200 NL plus. Do you know how many times I've heard absurd bullshit like that, guys? See if you're watching this video and you're like, I don't need GTO until I hit blah, blah, blah NL. This is such nonsense. Like, let's take GTO to mean one clear thing. Let's take it to mean the output, the exact equilibrium point between one strategy and another, given all of the bet size inputs, the range inputs that you've given your solver. That's what GTO is for some spot. GTO for poker is that in every single spot with every single configuration and possible set of inputs. That's absurd. Of course, we're not trying to learn that, however, if by GTO we can mean something a bit more akin to poker theory, a bit lighter, a bit broader and more general and more useful, and a bit more explanatory, then GTO or poker theory is relevant at every single stake. A 2NL player that studies how the game works and why will be way more successful than someone that just goes, value bet, value bet the fish, fold against the nets. Sure, obviously, like everybody can do that. There's not really a poker player out there that doesn't understand that against a huge drooler you can value bet, wider maybe, or against a massive net you should be folding. That's not gonna get you anywhere. Relying on exploits, inventing exploits, making them up for a ton of spots because you have no clue what's going on, this is a big problem. And way too many poker players are being schooled these days in a sort of black and white way where either they're being taught learn poker theory, study solvers, memorize outputs, play this range, play this strategy, or they're being told, ignore all that GTO wishy-washy stuff, just exploit the pool. But if you learn exploits without knowing any theory whatsoever, you just crash and burn really soon in your poker career. You're building your house on quicksand. Learn the theory, the exploits will come from there, but don't obsess over the exact facets of GTO. These two points, number two and number three, they really go hand in hand, so we have to talk about them together. Point number four is blind leading blind. This happens everywhere in poker because we get comfortable with little groups and communities and niches. I have a massive Discord server. It has about 200 people in it. It has senseis, people with a turquoise tag in my Discord server. If you're part of the Carrot Poker Discord and you become part of this by getting the Carrot Poker School, by the way, even just grade one is enough to get you into the server. And what you'll see there is some very strong professional poker players who have worked hard at this game for a decade, teaching newer people, posting in hand channels, showing them how to think and how to play. It's a beautiful process and the community is set up right. But what I've noticed happen within my community is smaller groups will form. And that's usually okay. I actually set up one group called Fast Track Carrots for a few people. One of them was actually my buddy that went to the World Series of Poker main event and came like 28th or something like that. Shout out to you, my moustached friend. He has a moustache, so we kind of refer to him as that. But yeah, in that group it was fine because I set up a bunch of people who were very similar level. They were all pretty competent. They all led each other well. I would drop in there sometimes, not as much as I should have. I know I know guys I should have been there more, but you get the point. The problem is when these little communities form and the players within them are all the same level, but that level is lower. And these are the players that haven't yet seen the objective truth of poker yet, who have tons of bad habits. They have more bad habits than good ones. They have more ignorance than knowledge, and they have more confusion than clarity. And when you get a group like that working together, and this could happen at the card room, it could happen at your 1-3 game, it could happen in the restaurant next to the card room that you go to with your buddies, it can happen in a little WhatsApp group or Discord server that you set up for the people that you feel comfortable with. Maybe they don't threaten you because they're a similar level. Maybe you like them as people. And so you've actually subconsciously, without really any planning, you've decided to work with these people in a small group on a regular basis. 
but actually none of you really know what's going on you don't have a mentor a coach a guru you don't have a more experienced player in there to help you or maybe you don't have enough of them and it's like blind leading blind you'll post a hand someone will be like oh i don't like this line in this spot because of x but x is only a tiny part of the puzzle but because you respect that person and x resonates with you and you feel comfortable speaking with this person you go of course x is the problem i should never have done this because of x then your buddy posts a hand later and you're like ah, 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 you can't do that because of x but actually it's just a bunch of people walking like this actually if this hadn't been cut off by the slide title on the left they're walking off a cliff guys that's where this goes you have to be super careful i know we work well in small communities i get it we're humans we like to do that but you know what we need to have more experienced people get a theoretical course work with a coach you know it may be worth it to invest in your game in a more serious way in order to make sure that you don't suffer from this blind leading blind trap i've worked in small groups before i've worked with students who have formed little study groups and then i'll talk to them i did group coaching once with a, with a bunch of guys lovely guys but every week they got worse they got worse at poker because i was only seeing them for two hours a week and they were spending 20 hours with each other you know teaching each other situations that weren't important learning ideas that were way overstated, missing ideas that were central cruxes to the puzzles they were trying to solve, and they got worse at poker because of it. It's okay to work with peers, people of a similar level as you, as long as you also seek guidance and feedback on a very regular basis. That's what our school does, by the way. It gives you feedback. We have exam feedback videos. We have homework tasks with feedback from me, so you can see how well you're doing from someone more experienced, not just your peers. So important. Tunnel vision. This happens strategically, technically. It also happens in a more broad, just approach to the game kind of way. Tunnel vision could be something as simple as playing in the morning in a tough Zoom game instead of table selecting in the evening when there's a 9 BB per 100 difference in your win rate between those two games. It's crazy. But people get sucked into what they know, they form habits, and they don't really question them enough. They don't examine whether there's a better path to success. This can happen technically at the table as well, where you're so sick of being raised that all that really matters when you think about betting the turn is what happens if you get raised. You tunnel in, you narrow your focus to such a point that you can't see what's around you. It's like zooming into an object. Like if I was to take my, my editor will hate me for this because it'll make the sound bad for a second, but if I take my microphone here, she's so angry right now that I'm changing the sound, and I zoom into it, all I'm gonna see is this. Can you tell what that is? Can you actually look at my webcam? Can you tell what that is right now? You can't because you're too far zoomed in. When you zoom out again, it becomes clear which object you were actually looking at. She's gonna hate me so much. I'm actually excited about how much it's gonna annoy her. But back to the point of the story, when you do this with one factor in a poker game tree, you have this wonderful game tree of all these ideas and together the branches on one side lead to a certain EV, the branches on the other side lead to another EV and your job is to pick a side, right? Pick which line is better. But to do that, you have to see the whole side of the tree. If you just take one leaf at the end of one twig, at the end of one stick, at the end of one branch, at the end of the trunk, what you're really doing is looking at a tiny part of the puzzle, but it's so easy to do this if one particular part of that game tree has really hurt us a lot recently, it's just really in the forefront of our mind for whatever reason. People get so obsessed with things like, I've got to bet for protection. I get protection here, I can't let them get there. It's just a tiny part of the game tree a lot of the time, or maybe a small part. Solvers know that. Solvers know this, guys. They know that betting for protection is beneficial, but they will still check that top pair on the turn sometimes because there are other benefits of checking that you're not seeing because you're so far zoomed in to what happens when your opponent folds. It's all you can think about. If you have tunnel vision, in fact, there's no F. You all have tunnel vision. I'm sorry, you. You have tunnel vision. I have tunnel vision. We all have it. Think about how you have it. What are the top five spots in which tunnel vision blinds you? What kind of things in game are you just so drawn to a certain desire for a certain type of action that you zoom in too much and you forget the rest of the stuff in the game tree? Let me know in the comments. I'm really enthused to hear it. Letting me know, letting the other viewers know, it will help us all as a community. We're all in this together. Point six, expecting to win. We don't do this consciously. I know you guys don't log in for your 50 Zoom session and say, I expect to win today. You know that, your conscious mind is fully aware that reality is different. That in reality, poker is a game of harsh variance. You can lose a ton. You can go on a 12 buy and downswing by doing absolutely nothing wrong. I know that you know this, right? And I know that you know that I know that you know this. But the point is, 
that subconsciously you want to win. Because in life, our brains are conditioned to get optimal results when we try to do something. For example, if I go down to my kitchen and I'm hungry and I go into my fridge and I take out some butter and I take out some milk to make a cup of coffee, I get some bread, I make a sandwich, I make a cup of coffee, I come back upstairs. I expect to be able to eat that sandwich and drink that coffee 100% of the time, not 44% of the time, 100% of the time. What would happen if 53% of the time, 31% of the time, 17% of the time, whatever, the sandwich disintegrated as I was about to eat it. The coffee exploded into a fireball and burned through my clothes and ruined them and burned my leg a little bit. It'd be awful. We are not trained to expect that kind of thing. So our brains have not evolved to be able to deal well with the environment, the hostile, volatile, high variance environment of poker. When you sit down to play and you lose four buy-ins, whether you like to admit it or not, that has violated the expectations, the hopes, the desires of your subconscious mind. Your conscious mind is like, hey man, I knew that could happen, that's okay. I knew that was possible, this happens, this is poker. That's poker, folks, as Doyle once said at the start of a famous poker show. But even though we know that's poker, folks, we don't accept it, we're not okay with it, and we're never going to accept it. Emotionally speaking, you're never gonna to be totally fine with a four buy and downswing while it's happening, four minutes after it's happened. You're gonna be reeling, you're gonna be pissed off. But when this gets completely out of control and we actually hate losing to the point that we cannot even handle it, lots of things go wrong. Firstly, we stop playing poker for a while, we take a dreaded hiatus, we run and cower and hide under the bed from the storm of bad variants that's going on and we stop playing for weeks. Maybe we go on tilt, we move up stakes, we try and get our money back. There's fight or flight here. There's also freeze, where we just play in a zombie trance and do nothing for two hours. We don't think, we just play and fritter away money. Play our F game as opposed to our, our A game. So this is problematic. What we need to do here is gradually adjust our expectations. You're not going to have a winning session more than about 57% of the time, even if you're a crusher. Unless you play sessions that last like a day, that's a bit different. But if you play a two hour session and you're like three tabling zoom or something like that, you're going to have a losing session like easily more than 40% of the time, even if you're, you're a killer. So you have to find a way to be a bit more okay each day, each time you lose, be a bit more okay with it. And you need to do a warm up where you actually visualize losing and you practice how you're going to try to react because your innate reaction, my friend, is going to be a tantrum. It's going to be defiance. It's gonna be, no, I reject that state of affairs. I'm angry, I'm sad. I don't wanna play poker anymore. I don't wanna play this game, I hate it. It's gonna be something like that for most of us. Let's just be honest here. We all suffer from this. Little steps every day, visualizing how we will actually react if we lose, trying to plan an optimal response from the optimal version of ourselves. Maybe not who we are today, but who we would like to be one day. That's what we should be working on. Keep a journal. How was I with losing three buy-ins today? How do I expect to do when I play later? How will I feel if I lose five buy-ins? Working on these things before and after the fact and being super reflective, objective and honest about it is the only way to get your expectations closer to the reality, the spread of possible outcomes in poker today, this week, this month, through all small samples. We're never gonna nail this completely. We're never going to be robots and nor should we be because then we would lack the motivation and the emotional inspiration, the spark to really do well. But we can manage this guys, it's small steps. Point number seven, bad planning. I did a session today with my friend Akshar, who's also my student, and it left me with a feeling of immense satisfaction. It left me feeling really good. As a teacher, you have sessions where you're like super proud of what you've achieved, you're super proud of your student, it's just gelled, you feel like so much progress has been made. And that is the main gratifying thing about teaching, that's why I do it, that's why I chose to build a coaching and teaching instructional poker business rather than try and become one of the best players in the world or battle it out at high stakes every day. I made this choice a long time ago, I'm very happy with it because one thing that came from today was that feeling of I did the right thing. and. To go into a bit more detail in today's session, I'm, I'm sure my student won't mind too much. You, you can catch him, by the way, on stream. Sometimes we do a stream called Coach Coaches Coach on Carrot Corner on Twitch. If you don't follow the stream, make sure you do. But actually, I was a good friend of mine and he was having a bit of difficulty. He was kind of saying, you know what? I feel like I'm not getting enough volume in. I feel like I'm just kind of, I don't quite have the energy required to put the volume in that I need to put in to achieve my poker goals. And it's leaving me feeling like, not quite a failure, but it's leaving me feeling a little bit pissed off at myself, a bit frustrated, I could be making more money, I'm a strong player, I'm playing really well when I play, but I'm just, I just don't have the energy, I just can't put in a second session that day, I play for two hours in the morning, I stop. And I was like, well, let's think about this, my friend, let's think about this, well, what are you doing 
schedule wise what do you do in the morning talk me through your days like okay i get up in the morning i go to the gym i work out really hard i come back i do this every day i play for a couple of hours then i eat lunch i get up at like 6 a.m gym play eat lunch and then i just don't want to play i just feel like if i play i play terribly i'm emotional blah 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 i'm reacting based on like the lizard brain and not the prefrontal cortex i'm not planning things out these are kind of my words and paraphrasing here and I was like, okay, well, do you know what? Our natural circadian rhythm as a human is such that about 1 p.m., 2 p.m., 3 p.m., this sort of time, we're programmed to have a dip in our circadian rhythm. It's a really good book called Why We Sleep by a chap called Matthew Walker, I believe, if I'm remembering the name right. You can check that out. It's it's awesome. It goes into like all the things to do with sleep. And, you know, in our tribes back in the day, we were supposed to have a dip at that time of day. I've tried to play poker at 2 p.m. in the afternoon, and I'm like an absolute baboon. I'm just like, wow, like smashing buttons everywhere, grabbing things, throwing chips left, right and centre, bluffing off in terrible spots, making awful calls, having no discipline, right? Opening a hand I shouldn't open because I want to. That kind of thing. I'm like a baby, a giant baby at the table at that time of day. So actually I wanted to get in more hands and I said, okay, well, why don't we try pinpointing a second time of the day that's not that natural slump in the afternoon? Because I'm with you, bro. You have that slump. I have that slump. We all have that slump actually at lunchtime. We don't work 9 to 5. We're not office workers. We're independent, free people. This is one of the benefits of poker and being self-employed with it. It's such a luxury. Okay, I'm recording at 2.11 right now. I never do this, guys. Usually I'm exercising by now because I cannot work at this time. And I said, well, when's the time when your energy levels pick back up again? He said, okay, like the evening, like 5 p.m. I said, play your second session then. And we basically restructured his day so that he was allowed to chill between 1 and 4 completely. His second session would be like 5 till 8, something like that. And by doing that, I'm 99% certain that we've just cured his lack of volume. Bad planning is so, so prevalent. It's not just that we play at the wrong time of day. We schedule sessions in the wrong part of the house. You schedule the session in the living room while your kids are running about and you tilted? No, no way, man. Surely not. You scheduled a session at 11 p.m. before you went to bed because the games were good but your circadian rhythm is just dipped and you have no energy left and you're about to fall asleep. No wonder you played bad. You didn't warm up for your session. You got angry. You had a huge argument with your other half and then you opened four tables of Zoom. This sort of bad planning is so common. Not having warm ups, not having cooldowns, not reviewing hands, not having a poker schedule, not having a study plan. A lack of order basically just means a mess. And when you have a mess, guys, you have no chance of success at this game. You really need to be super careful. Plan out your day. Make sure you're playing when you're focused and you have high energy. Make sure you're balancing your day and make sure that your environment is tip top. Make sure it's conducive to chilled, focused thought. Not impulses, not distractions, not emotions, no noisiness or clutter. None of those things. Plan your poker journey. It will go so much better. Let me know in what ways you have made planning improvements upon watching this video. They are much more important than you would think. They can slip under the radar. Let's move on. Point number eight, lack of objective self-scrutiny. This is a situation that really holds back many of my students. They don't actually zoom out, look at a bird's eye view and say, what's wrong with my game? What's wrong with my approach to poker? What's wrong with the way I play? How did I play this hand? How did I play in this session? What was my mental game like today? Or if they do do that, they do it in a kind of self-assuring way. Like, tell me I played this hand well, Pile Solve, or oh, it gave me a green tick. Awesome, I didn't make a mistake in this hand, now I can feel good about myself, I can rest on my laurels. Or posting a hand in the Discord server. Is this call okay? Someone's like, seems fine to me, they're like, thanks bro. Yeah, they go back to the session, they feel okay again, they validated themselves. There's no self-scrutiny. The way to get better at a hard pursuit like poker or any other game or any other field like this at all that's super complex and difficult for humans is to honestly ask yourself where you're at. Yesterday I did a stream where I studied exclusively 3-bet pots, big blind versus button because in my session the day before I noted two phenomena. Firstly I was freaking out in 3-bet pots because I didn't have enough theory compared to what I had in single raise pots, especially when one of the players was the big blind and had a non-standard, more polarized range than the linear ranges you would see in the small line, the button, the cutoff, where flatting is less commonplace. So this polarized big blind range, whether it was me that was wielding it or my opponent, it gave me a really sinking feeling. It gave me a feeling of like, I'm lost at sea here. I really don't know what I'm doing. And I had to honestly take check of that and say, despite the fact that I've built loads of poker courses and I've written about this in detail and I have, I've covered this topic in my courses, my brain, for whatever reason, in-game, 
doesn't quite know it well enough and it makes a mistake and then it goes, oh shit, like five seconds later, I forgot that's Big Blind there. So what I did was I drilled it for like two hours with my friend Sam on stream. I just drilled it. I just worked on it for a long time. And now I feel way better about it. Identify your weaknesses, both mental game and technically as well, and work on them. Don't just say, I want to feel better. You have a rough session, you want to be soothed, right? And that's important. Being soothed is fine. You can speak to a buddy about it. You can vent. You can talk to your coach. You can talk to your significant other. It's okay to feel soothed. But don't confuse feeling soothed with working on your game. Make sure you know what your intention is before you post a hand and get the type of feedback you're actually looking for. If you post a hand and you're wanting to be soothed and then you get criticism, you're not going to use that criticism even though it may be really valuable for you. You're going to project it. You're going to say, no, I don't want to listen to you right now. That's not fair. I reject that advice. Whether you do that explicitly or not, you're likely not to be open to that improvement advice. But if you post a hand and you say, this really annoys me. This is super frustrating. How do I handle this? How can I live with myself for making this mistake? You can get positive mental game feedback. And if you say, I've made peace with this hand mentally, emotionally, here is what I think honestly, objectively, about the technical side of it. You can get useful technical advice. Know what kind of feedback you're seeking and scrutinize yourself after you have processed the emotion. Don't analyze your hand or scrutinize your play while you're reeling from the emotional impact. It's okay to be upset. It's okay to be furious with yourself for making a play that you shouldn't make in the short term. But then you need to get over that. You need to put that aside and you need to use it constructively. And I'll tell you what, guys, the more curiosity you have in your brain, the more you fill your brain up with curiosity, fascination for this amazing game that we play, the less space there is for sort of being in denial, being brattish, being defiant, being belligerent. All of that goes out the window when you just become thirsty for knowledge. Point number nine, being in the wrong brain mode when you play. Remember, guys, I was just telling you that I had a really fulfilling and fun coaching session today with my friend Akshar. Another thing we talked about was him being in the wrong headspace when he fires up a session. He's a strong player. You know, he grinds 200 NL, he table selects, he's, he's profitable, he's been a winner for a long time, but sometimes he shows up and he described this phenomenon where things just weren't clicking. Like, my brain just doesn't work. I make impulsive calls, raises folds and as soon as I do it I'm like shit what am I playing at? Why am I being an absolute imbecile today? And this is so common because we do have two types of thinking. There's another book I like called Thinking Fast and Slow. I don't remember the author, let me know in the comments if you do know that book. A lot of you will, it's very very famous. And it basically talks about type 1 and type 2 types of thinking. Type 1 I believe is the kind of animal brain, the lizard brain, the impulsive quick dopamine reward circuit mechanisms that just basically get you to do something for an immediate payout. So calling because you want to see what they have and you want to win a hand, something like this could be the poker equivalent. And then there's type two, which is more the sort of deliberate, conscious, logical thinking where you're actually computing factors on a conscious level. You do need both of these to succeed. You need a bit of type one thinking when you're playing poker. But when type one takes over completely, you actually just become an impulsive monkey. When type two takes over completely, you are too deliberative. You're like thinking too hard. You're getting lost. You're timing out. You're doubting yourself. You have no conviction. You're not in the flow of the session. You need the right mix of these. That's why it's so important to do some kind of warm up activity, like work in a GTO trainer if you're learning theory of the game, review a hand from the day before, talk to a poker buddy, do a sweat, watch a video while taking notes, look at a bit of carrot poker school while attempting the homework tasks and then getting feedback on it from the feedback videos, that kind of thing, and then jump into your session. Your pre-game warm-up, it shouldn't be like 20 minutes, so you'll stop doing it every day, but like 5-10 minutes, you know, get into the right brain mode, make sure that you feel a good mix between type 1 and type 2 thinking before you sit down to play, because if it's all type 1, you know, RIP bankroll, if it's all type 2, RIP bankroll as well, but to a lesser extent, You've got to get this blend right between logic and creativity, impulsive conviction, and deliberative thinking. Hope that helps. And finally, and most relevantly for my purposes as a poker educator, a lack of organized education. You may have wondered why we call ourselves Carrot Corner Poker Education. When I say we, by the way, my girlfriend was asking me that the other day. She was like, why do you say we in videos? Sometimes she like watches the videos to help the view count. She's not really interested in poker. That's okay. But why do we call ourselves that? Why do I say we? It's more so just because 
I like to think of me and my students and my Discord server and, you know, my COO and everyone else at, at Carrot Corner as a tribe that have an ethos. And I like that ethos to be education. It's not just coaching. It's not just like, do this here, do this here. You know, you have an American football coach who's like, go here, go here, do this, do that. Drawing the playbook, go, go get him, go get him, Tiger, all of that stuff. That's not what coaching is in poker. Poker coaching should be educational as well. If you go to university and you do a course, you want to train to be a neuroscientist, or you want to train to be a mechanic at a top garage, or you want to train to be, I don't know, a plumber. All of these pursuits, you need like a formal education, right? You need someone to show you exactly how things work in an orderly way. You don't just wing it. You don't just pick it up by watching erratic bits and bobs of content like you find in training sites. So a lot of people, they watch high caliber content, you know, training sites. You know the big training sites, I won't name them, but a lot of them have very good coaches working for them. It's The problem is not quality, the problem is structure. And when your poker diet is actually just all over the place, it's Twitch streams, YouTube videos, talking with friends, your syllabus is a complete bomb site. If you looked at a university syllabus for a course on, say, mathematics, and it had 412 different topics, but they were only like 15 minutes of, of one, then another five minutes of another, then back to the first one, then 30 minutes of an unrelated one. You'd want your money back. You'd be like, what the hell have I enrolled in? But that's what you're doing when your poker learning is all just like fragmented. It's all just bits and bobs all over the place. That's what you're doing. You're reading two pages of a book, then grabbing another random book and reading that. That's no way to study something. You want an organized library of content and that's why I made the Carrot Poker School. You can get the school at carrotcorner.com. The investment may put you off, okay? It's a little pricey. If you can budget for it, having this organized content is amazing. If there were other courses like this that had that level of rigor, that level of organization, I would also say that they're good. But frankly, guys, I haven't really seen any. That's why I made my school. I'm not sitting here going, I'm the best poker player in the world and better than everybody else in the world. I do think I'm, I'm very good, but what is most important about the content that we make here is its structure and its academic prowess. And you don't get that anywhere else. And that's why I'm so adamant you guys buy the school. Of course, I want you to buy the school because I want to make sales and I want to I want to get compensated for all of my work and all of these things. I'd be, I'd be a madman to sit here and deny any of that. But another reason, that aside for now, why I think you should do something like the Carrot Poker School is that it's just going to allow you to put everything into place, it's going to click, it's going to let poker finally click for you because it's structurally the right way to do it. From lecture 1 to lecture 10 of each grade, there is a continuous rational progression, there is no overlap between grades and it's completely comprehensive so that by the time you reach the end of the school you're kind of doing everything. I didn't want this final point to be a plug for the school solely, it's just that there isn't really an alternative right now for cash game poker as far as I'm aware, I could be wrong. I don't think there's anything that really comes close. If you're not going to be able to get the Carrot Poker School because it's out with your budget, that's totally okay. But I would say that you should make your own poker syllabus in that case. You should like go to different sites, you should research topics, you should try to build it in a way that's rational where you work on the easiest things first that are the foundations and you ramp it up from there. I think that's what you've got to try to do. This has been a longer video than I thought it would be. Point 10 I'm super passionate about is basically our whole ethos here if you haven't got that already by watching my content. It's all about like, give poker the academic approach that it really deserves, I guess, is all I'm saying. Make sure that your education is as organized as possible. All right, guys, that takes us to the end of the video. I hope you've enjoyed this list. There are so many more things that are possibly preventing you from succeeding. Please do share your experiences. Write down the numbers that apply to you. You can just go 179, you can go 1236, whatever it may be, in the comments. If you want to say a bit more about those and elaborate on how they apply, that'd be awesome as well. If you like the format, let me know and I'll bring you more videos like this. It's important to smash the like button and let me know if you like this format. And if you haven't subscribed, you may not be getting alerts every Tuesday and Friday, but that's when our videos are out. The easiest thing to do is just to sub to the channel. You'll get a notification whenever they come out, but it's Tuesdays where I'll be bringing you guys content from my streams, my return to competitive cash game poker at 200 zoom, and also some 500 zoom at some point when the games are good, maybe 500 reg tables. That's every Tuesday and then Friday we have a random format of video. It could be a micro stakes video on how to crush 25 NL, not 10 NL because we don't play that guys remember. Or it could just be a video like this that's informative and, and just generally useful. Let us know what you think. See you in the next video. Much love guys. I hope this hasn't been too much of a plug, this final slide, but I do feel passionate about it and have a product that reflects that passion.
Carrot Poker School. Visit CarrotCorner.com. See you in the next video. Bye for now.